Is TA here? So, Carson, this is the guy who came up with this. 
Um, and okay, so you got the battery. Um, can I get? Uh, so, okay, can I get somebody else to try and get the battery for me, please? So from yes. Where? It's a uh, from the from the AV uh, people. It would be very nice if you, if you could get one because then the folks in the back can hear more. I apologize for that. I thought the so, so I don't get it from where. It, uh, so there's probably somebody who takes care of the audio video equipment. Uh, I'm just learning this as well. I'm, I apologize. So next time I'll know that I'll need to bring my own spare batteries. <laughs> I didn't know that before. Um, so a 9 volt battery would be awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. It's very kind of you. Um, so this is the estimation. So uh, Banabas probably talk, talked about that a little bit last time. And well, the idea is basically, you know, we observe some dot and we want to estimate the base. Well, you might want to do that, for instance, to find really unusual observations, or you might want to find really typical observations. Okay, so, and you can, as soon as you can do this estimation, well, you can do everything, right? Because if you can estimate the joint density P of X and Y, then I can get P of Y given X. So, you know, Y is maybe a binary classification, maybe it's a regression output, by just taking the ratio between P of X and Y and P of X. Right? So, well, you know, plugging in terms, this is P of X given Y times P of Y divided by the sum over all Y primes, P of X given Y prime times P of Y prime. So, as soon as I have a tool for getting a density in X, I immediately have a tool for estimating P of Y given X. Which is quite awesome, right? So, how do we do that? Well. In the simplest case, well, you know, we just have some discrete random variables, let's say English, Chinese, German, French, whatever, and male and female, let's say, so I have, you know, two coordinates in my random variable, and maybe I observe 25 observations, and I just count them, right? So I make a pin for English and male, and Chinese and male, and so on and so on and so on, right? And then I count. And then what I do is I just take the ratio of the counts versus the total counts, and that gives me some idea of a probability. Of course, that's not really the truth because I only observe 25 observations, but it's not that bad. Can somebody see something uh, going wrong with this? Exactly. Right. You see the slides before? So the issue is uh, basically we don't really have much data here, right? And so with bins, this is still reasonably benign, you know. Look, we've got 10 bins, and if you have maybe around 100 observations, so basically if you have parameters, take having 10 times as much data as you have parameters is, as a rule of thumb, not a terrible situation to be in. I mean, we'll get into all the details of that uh, in quite a lot more, you know, with, with quite more stuff. I mean, later on when we look at convergence bounds and so on. But as a rule of thumb, if you have to estimate a thousand parameters, it's good if you have 10,000 data points. So the curse of dimensionality, in the light version at least, is that, you know, the number of bins grows exponentially with the number of dimensions. So as we get more and more bins, if we really look at the fine partition of everything, well, we'll end up with a situation where almost all bins are empty. Right? And this is not a very unrealistic setting. This, for instance, is something that you would do if you wanted to sell ads, right? You might want to know where the request came from. You might have some idea about the gender and the nationality of the user. You might well, you'll definitely know what day of the week it is, and you can infer a lot of properties about the browser, the operating system, God knows whatever, directly <coughs> from the session. And, well, you might even have some continuous random variables, so you might have an estimate of the income. Uh, there are companies on the internet that sell estimates of the financial status of the user who goes to the site. 
it's none of the major internet companies, but it's a company that we probably know of, and they sell the stuff. You might know about the bandwidth, you might know, you know how much time it took to actually go to that page. So now we have continuous random variables, and there it's actually even worse, right? Because, well, for instance, we might want to discretize things. So let's say this is our data, sample drawn from that underlying density. So, well, I could just make an infinite number of bins, but that's clearly not starter. But I could, you know, maybe take 10 bins on the unit interval. You know, if I take 10 bins here, it's going to be okay-ish. But then if I have 10 dimensions, 10 to the 10 bins is clearly no good. Because the probability <coughs> mass per cell also decreases as in 10 to the 10. So in other words, for any realistic situations, almost all bins are empty. Okay, so this is no good. Let's have a look at what happens. So this is our density, <coughs> some data that you've been counting. And even in one dimension, this is kind of, well, not so beautiful. Uh, what would you rather do if you saw something like this? Any suggestions? Estimate some sort of underlying distribution. Correct. So this is an estimate of the underlying distribution, but it's not a very beautiful one. What is ugly about it? What's ugly about that estimate? Not smooth. It's not smooth. Exactly. So. Basically, you know, around here, around there, this looks really awful. So can't we just go and smooth this out a little bit, right? And that's exactly what you can do. And this is what Parson Windows will do. Parson Windows will basically give us a smoothed out version of that underlying distribution. So, well, let's just see what's happening a little bit in terms of statistics. So, you know, if we were to do bin counting. So Hoefling's theorem is something that we'll get to in a lot more detail later on in the class. Right now, just uh, you know, treat this as something that fell from the sky. So Hoefling's theorem is a theorem that gives me a high probability guarantee of averages not deviating much from their true expectation by more than some epsilon. Right? So, Hoefling's theorem says, in its simplest form, for a random variable that can take values between 0 and 1, that the probability that the expected value of this random variable deviates from the empirical average, so I draw n times this random variable from that distribution, that this deviation is larger than epsilon, is less equal than 2 e to the minus 2 m epsilon squared. This is really awesome because basically, for a fixed epsilon, as I increase m, I can see that this bound gets exponentially fast time. So if I fix my accuracy, a little bit more data goes a very long way. On the other hand, if I impose that the probability is a constant, then basically what it means is that m has to scale like 1 over epsilon squared, or conversely, epsilon goes like 1 over square root m, right? Because the right-hand side of this inequality now needs to be constant, and so I can get a bit more accuracy by getting more data. So if I fix the probability, it then unfortunately means that I need 100 times as much data to get 1 tenth of the error bar. This is not so good news. And there are actually, in some cases, tricks on how to work around that, and we might get to that eventually. OK, but let's just you know, use this Hoefling theorem. And so you know, if you think about it, we can now define random variables. Let's pick a particular bin. And within the particular bin, um, can I have the bin? Thank you very much. So within uh, that bin, what you can then do is you can basically just define a random variable that defines the that bin. Let me switch. Awesome. 
So let's take our bins. Let's call this bins one, two, three, and four. And let's say I'm only interested in four bins. So I define random variables <coughs> x1, x2, x3, and x4. And what I do is I draw an observation. Let's say I draw one, and it falls into this bin. Then I, well, we'll get that this random variable here, so this is draw one, is one, and all these other guys are zero. Then maybe I draw another time and it falls in here, so I get at draw two, that this is all zero, zero, one, zero, and so on and so on. So now let's focus in on this random variable here. The probability of this random variable being one is equal to, well, the probability mass that falls into this bin. So, in other words, we have exactly Hoeking's theorem, so the expected value of x2 is equal, by definition, the probability that x is in bin 2. Right? And so, now, the empirical average here, which satisfies exactly the conditions of hefting, namely, it's a random variable, um, so this would be instantiation of this random variable, x to 1, x to 2, x to 3, and so on, up to x x to m. Um, the average over that should converge to that probability. It's not x squared, it's x to um, And so, well, we can just apply our fixed bound to that. So we know that the probability that the random variables are in the bin will converge. That's good. But now we actually have not just one bin, but we have, in this case, four bins. Well, so what happens? It's actually very simple. We want to make sure that the soup, so the deviation between empirical average and true probability over all the bins is small. Okay, so this is the worst case that can happen. And what you then do is you use a trick that is actually very common. Um, and we're going to see that over and over. So in many cases, in learning theory, you do this. You basically have you know, the soup over all those events. And the probability that something goes wrong in one of the, in at least one of those events is less equal than the sum over the probabilities that each of, in each of those events something can go wrong. So, uh, I need to buy one. Can you give me that one? So I can go um, on. Yep. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's very, very kind of you. <coughs> awesome. That's really tough. Um, so what happens is basically the probability that something can go wrong in at least one case is of course less equal than the sum of the probabilities that something could go wrong in each of those individual bits. This is a very important step and you will see it over and over. This is why I'm just going through this here. This is the simplest application. And so now I can go and apply Hoefding for each of those deviations. And we know that this is, you know, 2e to the minus 2m epsilon squared. Right? And now since I have a such bins, well, it's just 2ae to the minus 2m epsilon squared. So if I now go and solve for some error probability, so what we have is delta is well two size a e to the minus two m m squared, right? So from that it follows that e to the minus two m epsilon squared equals delta over 2a. Now we can take the log of it. So it follows that minus 
to m epsilon squared is log of delta minus log of 2a to that. So then I go and divide by 2m and you know with the signs. And so I get that epsilon squared is log 2a. Minus log delta, but that's okay. But that's a pro that's a failure probability, so that's like five percent or whatever, divided by two m. And then you take the square root, and presto, you have a nice inequality. So, if we look at that, a couple of nice things happen. So first of all, the size so basically the number of pins only enters logarithmically in the inequality. This is useful because, and we'll see that over and over. So that's actually pretty good because remember before, the number of pins grew exponentially in the dimension, in the number of dimensions. Here we have something that only takes the log of the number of pins into account. So what that means is it's basically linear in the number of dimensions. That's not too bad, but it's still quite bad. And, well, so basically that's not really good enough. It's not really good enough because, uh, well, if you have a lot of beans, I mean, it's just not going to work very well. So how do you fix it instead? Well, one of the key things is that we made this assumption that all those beans are independent, right? But they aren't. Because, I mean, you know, they, we know how they are spatially allocated, and we know that, you know, if the density is high at one point, there's a good chance that the density just nearby is also high because I'm making the assumption that my densities are smooth. So unless you make any specific further assumptions on your density, um, you're screwed. However, as soon as you make some assumptions on the density, you can actually get better inequalities. And we are now going to make use of that in the context of density estimation. Any questions about that? Why do you say that has uh, less than equal? Um, well, because... No, I mean the last thing. That's over 2A. Uh, um, why is less than that? Well, would you please more clarify what's delta here? And, uh, what's the difference? Okay. So, delta is the probability that this inequality will not hold. So, delta is going to be like 5%. Epsilon is the range, the interval, within which um, the deviation will be contained. And so what I know is that with, you know, at most 5% probability, my empirical sample and the corresponding empirical average will exceed the epsilon interval here. So I could be lucky and my epsilon interval might be absolutely minuscule. That would, for instance, be the case if I have a very flat distribution and you know everything's nicely laid out. So that's why you have an inequality for the epsilon going this way. Of course, if I pick a, le a larger epsilon, the inequality still holds, but I know that in reality that's the epsilon that's how it's gonna go. Okay. Now let's go back to being counting. But thanks, that's a very good question. Any other questions so far? Yep. Uh, what is A? Oh, A is the no, is the set of pins. So in the example before, it would have been four. So the set A is the no, is the set of pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four. So A equals four. More generally. A is the set of, you know, sets with respect to which I'm measuring things. Note that in our derivation, we didn't really require that these sets need to be disjoint, right? So you could actually have overlapping sets and still get the same inequality. And sometimes you can design more interesting estimates based on that. 
Any other questions? Thanks for asking those questions. This is good. Okay. So let's get back to being Um So the idea was, well, hey, we want to smooth this out. And this is exactly what Mr. Parson also thought. And so that's what he did. So he basically said, well, hey, let's start first with this empirical distribution. You know, that's basically just putting a delta distribution wherever, you know, we observe something. And then we perform a kernel density. So we smear out the empirical density with a non negative smoothing kernel. And the only thing that we require of the smoothing kernel is that it integrates out and by. So let me put some examples to it. That will make it a lot more clear. Awesome. Thanks for the batteries. <laughs> okay, thanks. Fabulous. sort of understand me. Good. <laughs> awesome. So, here's what Mr. Parson did. He said, well, let's take the empirical average, you know, this empirical distribution, and let's just replace each of those delta peaks by, you know, some kernels. And, you know, these are some kernels that, you know, people pick. The most obvious thing is you could pick a Gaussian or a Laplace or a Konechkov, so that's basically just a parabola that's been chopped off, or this is just the indicator function over the unit interval. So, in other words, what happens is you have your observations, right? You have those guys. Initially, you have this, and now you replace each of these by, you know, let's say a Gaussian bar. And then what you get out of it is something that will probably look a little bit like this. Right? And if you pick, let's say, the indicator function, well, it would look, it would look a little bit less free. Right? So that's what you get for the indicator function. And you might think that actually it's really, really important to get that shape of the smoothing kernel right. And as a matter of fact, if you want to look at asymptotics and, you know, derive all sorts of cool inequalities, yes, the shape of the kernel actually matters. In practice, forget about it. In practice, what matters is actually the parameters, much, much more. So let me show you what happens. So here's some data drawn from the underlying things. And well, now we're going to invoke this absolutely high-tech piece of code here, right? This is the kernel density estimator. 
two lines. So the first line does the following thing. It just computes the distances between you know, my set of reference points, x. These are the ones that I drew from density. And the new point x. Okay, in this case, it's one dimension, but you could have more than one you know, column norms here. And then, well, what I do is I just you know, put Gaussians around each of them. I rescale them suitably, so more generally you would have some sigma in there because you would have a different kernel width. And yeah, that's about it. Actually, the code is kind of more complicated because I said d equals 1, so I could have just written 0.5 here, but it doesn't matter. So this is, this is it. And what you get is for the Laplace kernel, that function, the Laplace kernel, if I screw up the kernel width, I get this. And, well, if I take a Gaussian kernel, the story is exactly the same. So what you're seeing on the top pictures is the density estimate. So for, okay, does anybody have an idea which one uses the very narrow kernel and which one uses the very wide kernel? The wide one uses. So the wide one is on the left or on the right? Right, right, so, right. <coughs> exactly. And on the left one, it uses an insanely narrow kernel. So, actually, it's way from there, sorry. <laughs> kernel at point three, one, three, ten. Okay, that was an easy question. <laughs> um, but what you can see is that basically, taking such a narrow kernel isn't maybe such a bright idea. So, what's going on? Well, if we pick a very narrow kernel, what we'll actually get is that the data likelihood, so the apparent explanation of the data under our estimate becomes insanely awesomely good. Because this kernel gets narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. And so if we compute the likelihood of the data under its own estimate, you know, it'll get more and more big where I actually observe the data. So if I were to do maximum likelihood estimation, then the optimal thing to do would be to pick a kernel with, you know, vanishing width. But that's clearly not the point, right? Because you actually want to, you know, smooth somewhere in between. I mean, that's what we started with. If I pick a kernel that's just insanely wide, I don't really retain any information about the data, so that's no good either. So that gets us to the point how we choose it. Does somebody have any ideas on what you could do to choose it? The question in the back. Yeah, I can define smoothing kernel. Pardon? Can you define smoothing kernel? The smoothing kernel is the kernel from the parse and windows kernel density estimate. So that's basically this guy here. Right? It better be greater or equal than zero because if you have a density that at some point is zero, that's no good. Uh, that's negative, that's no good. And secondly, it needs to integrate out to one, such that in the end, when we get our density estimate, everything you know, is a proper distribution again. Right? So that is what I define as a smoothing kernel. Now, these kernels don't necessarily have to be the same throughout the domain. But for the moment, to make our life easier, you would do that. Here are four examples of such smoothing kernels. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, do you have a, a specific name for the pyramid-like kernel? Um, it almost certainly has a name, and I definitely forgot about it. But if you go to Wikipedia and look for Eponeshko, the Council of Class in Uniform, you would almost certainly find that kernel as well. So. For about five years, it was a good investment of your time if you were a PhD student to go and invent new kernels and improve properties of them. At some point, that got old really fast because people realized that the shape of the kernel doesn't really buy you that much. But it almost certainly has a name, and you most definitely can use it if you want to. Yep? Oh, yes? Um, what I wanted to ask was do you sometimes mix and match kernels or do basically estimate the distribution, or do you only use one kind of kernel? 
Okay, so the question was, can you use different kernels for different uh, observations? You could. Um, the analysis gets kind of harder, because now you need to control also which kernel you're choosing. Well, you could do that. I don't know whether people have written papers about it. Actually, it's almost sure that 20, 30 years ago, somebody would have written a paper about it. Uh, but yes, you could do that. Um, we'll actually encounter sort of a situation of that kind afterwards when we look at silver mass trick. And there you effectively pick a different kernel for every location. Uh, good question. Any other questions? Thanks. These are really great questions. I'm happy. Uh, so. Let's get to one selection, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. You haven't answered your own question, like how do we decide how the weight of the kernel is going to Exactly. This is what I'm going to answer now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, let's have a look at what happens, right? So, you know, if we do maximum likelihood, well, we need to measure how well we do. And unfortunately, if we so this is, would be the data likelihood, you know, p of x would be you know, the product of p of x size. And so if I find, you know, a finding a k that maximizes p of x sub type of at all data points, well, what happens there is, and you can easily see, I take a kernel, let's say this was, for instance, the information curve, and I make it narrower and narrower. And it gets obviously taller because the area under the curve has to remain one. And you can clearly see that I didn't do a very good job at drawing because the two starting points are at a slightly different height. And you see that if you scale it up insanely. But what you can clearly see is that this thing starts peaking and starts looking like a delta distribution. As a matter of fact, you can introduce delta distributions that way as a little bit case. But basically, it's no good. So it overfits like crazy. So how can we fix it? I think can choose, so, uh, let's say we might have five or five data. We might choose three of them and do the curve and use the other two to... Okay. Perfect. So the suggestion is take some of the data and build a model on that and then check on the rest of the data how well it does. And this is exactly what we will be doing. That's exactly the right answer. So, just to drive this point home, you overfit. And here we run the fit. It's very too simple. So the idea is basically to use a validation set. And I mean, that's one approach. There are a couple of other approaches as well. So basically, I take some data, I leave that out, I use the rest of the data to build my model, and then I check on my validation set, you know, how well I do, and I choose the parameter that works best. <coughs> so basically, x prime my validation set, x is my, you know, data sets I use to build that state parts and windows, that's the estimate. And so then I get p hat. Actually, I would have to subscript that with capital X because that's what it depends on. I look at all the log likelihoods of x i prime because it's easier to work with sums than products, so that's why people usually take logs. And then, you know, for good measure, it's the sum like an average. And so this is the expected log likelihood. There's another way how you can go about this. And this is by using learning theory. And this is how you can get a lot of beautiful papers. Um, and they're deep papers, meaningful papers. They prove ratings, whatever. In practice, this is just so much easier, especially if you're beginning, use this. You basically take a validation set, take a training set, and that's it. Um, here's a problem. If I do this, right? Okay, so you know, in, in a way, I'm 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 still stuck. This, yes, this is super easy, but let's say I have you know, a hundred patients with cancer, and I use eighty patients to build my model, and then I use the remaining twenty patients to, you know, validate. Then I'm effectively not really making the best use of those remaining twenty patients. Even if you do some sort of cross validation. Exactly. So that's the next slide. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are great. So uh, 
that's exactly what I was going to lead up to. So, of course, you can go and sit down and uh, build a very beautiful theorem, and that's going to keep you busy for a while. Um, but the idea is basically, well, if I use some, some part of the data for training, the other part for testing, then effectively that testing data set isn't so great, but maybe I can do that with different partitions. And then use a different partition each time and average. So in the most extreme case, this is called leave one out cross validation. So I use everything but the single instance to estimate the density. I evaluate this on that single instance. So this is P of xi given that I've used everything but that xi to build the model. So therefore, you know, this is fair. And well, what do I get? This is the log of 1 over n minus 1, sum over j not equal to i, k of x sine is j. Okay. And if I just take a single one of those guys, I mean, yes, it's almost unbiased, this has huge variance. Um, by the way, why is it only almost unbiased? Why is this not really the truth? Does somebody have an idea? It's a very subtle thing of what's going on there. Anybody have a? Okay, so the issue is that I'm taking an average over n minus 1 observations rather than n. So the slightly, un the fact that it's not quite unbiased is because it has one training point less. So in practice, you don't care, but if you prove a theorem, you have to dot the i's across the t's. Okay. So, back to this. So, how do we actually then make it work? Well, we go and average over these estimates for all training data. And then we just, you know, go and pick the parameters that work based. So, the point is, you can actually implement that fairly easily. And I'm going to derive an equation for you. Or does everybody see this equation immediately, how I get from here to there? Probably not. Okay. Um, camera. Remember, we had P of X <coughs> was 1 over N. So 1 over N. Sum over I goes from 1 to N, K of X, I, and X. Right? So, therefore, if I take the i observation out, and I want to get an, an estimate of that, so basically p sub x, so p sub x without xi is just 1 over m minus 1 sum over j not equal to i, k of xi and x. Now, this is the same thing as m over m minus 1. And here now we have m times p of x minus k of xi. should be only in log space, right? Um, for the probabilities, not yet. But for the log of the probabilities, I will get a log here, and I will get a log here, and I get a log here, and a log here, and a log here. But since I'm lazy, I have not written the logs. On the second line, should it be k x j x? Yeah. Correct, yeah. yes. It should be k of x j x. x i x no, it's, it's j, sum over all the j's not equal to i, because I'm leaving the i to i out. So I could have also made this sum already loop over j. But here i wasn't bound yet, so I'm OK to do it, but it doesn't look so pretty. So, yeah. Um, so that's, uh, let me zoom out a little bit. So that's what you can do. And then, 
If you just plug this in here, you get exactly the expansion. So now why is this good? Because I basically can go and come up with my density estimate computed at all locations, and then to get the term for the lead one out estimate, all I'm doing is is I'm just removing the self-contribution. Because I'm interested in P, so this was X. So if I plug XI in here, right, it goes there. And so the one term that I'm removing is, I'm removing the term K of XI and XI. And if we scan back a few slides, you could see that this was exactly the culprit, right? Because the density would estimate at its own location, it would overestimate this completely. It would peak there. If that peak came from some other observation, well, that's fine. But if it comes from the observation whose density I want to evaluate, well, that's all of it. That's basically what was happening. So now let's actually see how well that works. So here what we get is a very simple curve <coughs> where I look at the log likelihood for the leave one out score and it peaks somewhere and it gets worse again. And what you see here is if I pick a really wide kernel, it overfits. If I pick a really narrow kernel, it also, sorry, here it underfits, there it overfits. And well, you know, there's some nice region in between. Now, the term that you get is maybe not exactly the one that you would have intuitively picked, but you might agree that this is not an atrocious density estimate for the observations that we have. Now, in practice, you might actually be a little bit lazier and say, well, hey, this leave one out is maybe too costly, so I perform a cable cross validation. So whenever you can do the leave one out, it's great. If you can't get away with computing it, then k-fold is still pretty good. And that you can do regardless of the algorithm quite easily. So you basically split the data into k blocks, typically k equals 10. And then you use all the data about this one block to compute the estimate, and use the remaining one to get the validation set and your average. So it's exactly the same procedure as before, but just that, you know, you take 10. So here's a puzzle for you, and think about it until next week if you want. Why can't we go and adjust 100 different parameters using this model? Basically, or, you know, why is there a problem if I use my you know, tenfold or you know, you know, overall cross-validation estimate to adjust a ridiculously large number of parameters? Can you break it? Basically, think about a counterexample how you can break it. Are there any questions so far? So this is conceptually new, and you've seen now the first example of what happens with overfitting and how you can combat it by basically just the newly one out estimate. And I hope that by now at least you could go off and build a decent density estimate. It might not be the most beautiful one, but it'll do it to the trick. So. Uh, now let's use that to build the Watson the direct estimate. Um, so remember I said, well, hey, if we can do density estimation, we can do everything. So um, to quote Vatnik, uh, if you have the density, then you can play God. Um, well, we don't quite want to play God here, but at least we want to get a classifier. Um, so remember what we had was that p of y given x can be just written out by using base rule and such. And now all I do is I just, you know, take, let's say for the positive class, I come up with a density estimate. For the negative class, I come up with a density estimate. And, you know, for the overall density p of x, you know, I can also come up with a density estimate, right? And so what do I get? I get that p of y given x it's just given by that ratio. That's it. And so how do we get that ratio? Well, 
This is so P of X, that's our stock, that's our conventional Parson window authentication. Right? P of X given Y equals one, well I take all the guys that you know for which I observe XI in one, I take that in estimate. Then I need to multiply it with the estimate for the probability P of Y. Well that's MY over M. So then thankfully the MYs cancel out. And they get the ratio of 1 over m, sum of <coughs> all these guys for which y equals 1, divided by the sum over all the cases. And then I could actually start asking, well, is there a decision boundary? Because, well, for that, for instance, you would have to check whether the value is above 1 half or less than 1 half. So I can just take the difference between those terms. And then, well, all I need to do is I, if you check the math, you just get sum of the yi, k of xi and x divided by this. So if the 1 over m's cancel out, of course, so that's all you get. And you can also rewrite it as such. Because all I've done now here is I've pulled the sum over the i's out, and I have k of xi and x divided by, well, this sum here. And now I basically get local weights. So these terms are numbers between 0 and 1. They all add up to 1. I mean, they have to, because if I sum over all i, right, that's what happens. And that actually should be a j here, right? Then I basically just get a weighted average over, you know, all the labels, and the labels that are really close will get a higher weight, and those that are really far away get a low weight. Any questions at this point? Why do you change the, uh, the index from i to j for the last um, Because I have the sum over j on the outside, and the sum over the i's on the inside, and I only did it half-heartedly, and that's why this is a bug. It should be a J. Yeah. That's what happens if you use cut and paste. Um, yeah. Now, so basically, you'll see the same bug actually five slides down, down the road. Maybe, down the road again. Does somebody have an idea of how I could simplify this? So in other words, do I really need this denominator? Do I need the denominator to build a classifier? Yes? No? Who votes for yes? Who votes for no? Okay. Good. So, what do I lose if I don't divide by the denominator? I lose the normalization. So before, I knew how much more this was a class 1 than a class minus 1. What I get if I remove the normalization is I get something that's much faster to compute, but I don't necessarily have a, you know, the proper normalization anymore, so it doesn't tell me much about the confidence anymore of the observations. Let's have a look at how that plays out in practice. There's some data actually it's drawn from two Gaussians, so the optimal solution would actually have to be just a straight line, because they're two Gaussians with the same variance. But of course, since you're drawing from it, it's not quite that. So here's what you get. And here's the awesome high-tech code that you can run in order to build this yourself. It's two lines. These are the kinds of things you should remember, because at some point in your life, you will need stuff like this. And then at least you need to be able to read your writers. And so what you see is that, you know, this is very confidently, you know, the red guys, these are very confidently the blue guys, and here's a decision bar. And that's this. And this is a pretty good classifier. Any questions here? Okay. So now let's, you know, push this through. Well, we can build a regression estimate. 
So if you think about it, this was the equation we saw before. Now again, we're the same log as before, right? This was basically a weighted sum over those yj's with some weighting coefficients here. And this weighting coefficient, you know, depended on x, but that was about it. So, you know, this is, you know, locally my weighted average. Well, rather than plus or minus one, I can just stick in any number. And that's exactly what Watson and Nadaria did. They said, well, hey, use the same equation as before, we just plug in any arbitrary number, and gee whiz, you get a nice algorithm. And the original paper of Nadaria is, I think, four pages long. So this was really, that's pretty much the idea, right? And this now gives you a locally weighted average. You go, so same code, so you don't even need to see the pseudocode, but well, the math code again. Here's the data, the rate curve is the original data generating distribution. And here's what we get. It doesn't look too bad. Right? So, you know, it works pretty well here. What you also see is that things start going a little bit wrong at the boundaries. That's because you don't have much data. This is sometimes called boundary bias. A lot of estimators have that problem. So, if you have a situation of that kind, uh, search for boundary bias, and there are often techniques on how to address that a little bit. So that's a regression estimate. So then, there's Silman's rule. Um, so this is exactly what gets us to: Can we use a different kernel in different places? So in a way, OK, let, actually, let me show you the density first and what happens. So let's say this is our true density. Stuff like that would happen, for instance, if you want to estimate the population density in Pennsylvania, right? So you've got Philadelphia, you've got Pittsburgh, and you've got a lot of regions where there is very little. <coughs> if you want, if you use a parcel window density estimate, and you know you have large rural areas where maybe on one square mile there are five people, you're going to do an absolutely horrible job in Pittsburgh. But if you use a very narrow kernel that fits Pittsburgh really well, right, then you know in the middle of nowhere, you're going to do an absolutely horrific job because you're just going to estimate that the population density is zero in many places. So what that effectively means is that if you actually knew the density, you could come up with a very good density estimate. But that's, of course, quite futile, right? So let me show you how horrible this thing half is, right? So it does a decent job here, except that it almost smooths a little bit. And here, it clearly overfits. Right. I mean, there's just no way these ideas will come to see. Turns out, you can get something like this, where the blue curve is the estimate and the red curve is the true estimate. So now you're, of course, curious how did I do it, right? So basically, how we have this chicken and egg problem. If we knew the density, we could estimate it well. But if we could estimate the density really well, we'd also, also, of course, have the density. So can we work around that? Well, the simple hack is basically that we're just going to look at the average distance to the k nearest neighbors. So I'm just going to take this point, look into its neighborhood, and look at what the average typical length scales are. And I do that for each and every point. So this isn't quite a density estimate, but it gives me some notion of you know, a length scale. And what's a half to the length scale? Well, I just use that length scale as the reference point for my kernel density estimate. <coughs> and you know, I take some multiple, like two or whatever, of that length scale. And that's it. So that's the limit straight. And you get this. So if you look at the dense distribution, well, kind of works. So, now, nearest neighbor. This is sort of the punching bag of all classification and regression algorithms, and if you want to show, if you have a mediocre algorithm and you want to find one that's even worse, quite often people pick nearest neighbor. Um, that's it. You should actually make sure that 
you estimate that beats the nearest neighbor. So quite often people come and come up with new algorithms and then they don't beat the nearest neighbor estimate. And that's usually the end of the algorithm. <laughs> um, it gets embarrassing when they get the paper published and then afterwards somebody else does this. So do it yourself because otherwise if you have something that gets beaten by the nearest neighbor, it's really embarrassing. <laughs> okay, so you know, it's actually a really cool algorithm if you get a couple of things right. It's not such a weak algorithm, so don't underestimate it. Um, so the simplest thing you could do is, if I have some observations, I just do a simple table lookup, right? And of course that usually doesn't work because we, then we wouldn't be here doing machine learning. So we don't quite get to look up the same thing, so we look up something similar. And so for nearest neighbor, well, you just go and pick the most similar neighbor. And various PhD theses and, uh, have been written on how to find a good similarity measure. And even nowadays, also in computer vision, sometimes people use a nearest neighbor or some sort of that approach with a heavily fine-tuned metric. So you can do a lot of machine learning by just being really, really smart about the metric. And, well, if you want to do integration, then you just don't take only, you know, well, basically either take, you know, the value, you know, the real value of the nearest guy, or if I have k guys, I just average them. And this is reasonably easy to implement. And so let's see how we can get there from what's in Nadaria. Remember, in what's in Nadaria, we have this equation which still has the same type of, so you can see it's cut and paste three times. Here it's correct, so if we have yj, wj of x. And those local weights were, would basically be large if x was really similar to xj and very close to zero otherwise. And the idea for the nearest neighbor estimate is simply to say, well, okay, these terms are zero if I'm not among the k nearest guys, and they are 1 over k if I'm within those, and that's exactly what the nearest neighbor estimate does. So I basically get k nearest neighbors from what's not area by using a hard threshold function and giving everything within that region the same way. So in a way, Silverman's rule and what's not area together will give me that. And you already saw those pictures, right? Um, right, and so this is basically if I have four nearest neighbors and you can see, well, this is the region where I have four reds, three reds, four reds again, two reds, um, two blues, three blues, four, four. Two blues, three blues, four blues, something like that. Anyway. Could you so, back up to the formula for a second? Sure. Of course. So this is, this is about as simple and easy proof as it can, right? It's basically take a document, take an image, take whatever, and give a you know, similarity of distance function. Pick the, let's say k equals 5, pick the five most similar guys. Take the majority of the labels. Yep? So why is the benefit of using uh, nearest neighborhood instead of the version uh, uh, number? Yeah, so very, very good point. So basically, why on earth do I even bother about talking about nearest neighbors given that I maligned it so much, right? So first of all, it, does, it's, it works okay. Secondly, if I, let's say I give you a million data points, you may be able to come up with a really clever data structure to find the five nearest guys in this one among those million data points ring cheaply. Whereas computing a Parson Windows sum where I then have to compute a Gaussian over you know one million terms could take a really long time. As a matter of fact, for instance, when you do a web search, right, then actually what happens is that the query terms, if you type them into Google, they go through a series of servers which are basically performing something like a nearest neighbor query for those terms. I mean, it's a lot more complicated, there's a lot of fine-tuning and various stages in there, 
But effectively, they're doing a nearest neighbor lookup over, let's say, more than 10 billion pages. But, but and in this case, this can be done, as, you, as we all know, in milliseconds. Whereas, if I had to compute the sum over 10 billion terms, but usually you also do truncated Gaussian currency. You, yes. That also saves the computation. So, very good point. So, one option is, of course, I don't take a Gaussian, but I just tr truncate the Gaussian, or I take the Eponishkov kernel, or something like that, or I take this triangle kernel that you suggested before. Any of those would make the problem less bad. But it would still be bad in the regions of high density. Unless you then go and also make it dense, you know, densely adaptive. So I would imagine that by doing a lot of clever engineering, you could make what's in the area go quite fast. At that point, you'll have spent so much in, you know, comp computation on engineering to make it fast, you might as well use a better estimator. So there are better tools than these techniques out there. So once you start doing a lot of engineering, you might as well, you know, not put, you know, a moped engine into a truck, you might as well put the truck engine in there. So that's why, yeah, if we didn't know any better, we would all be doing exactly what you suggested. This is, this is exactly the right approach if you want to make what's not area fast. What's not area has a couple of other downfalls as soon as you go to higher dimensionality and so on. And this is why, in the end, people are using, for instance, you know, kernel methods, as in Hilbert-Schmidt kernels, or they're using deep belief networks of boosting, or a lot of other techniques. But, yeah, for 10 to 20 dimensional problems, this is awesome. Okay. So let's look at this, and you've already seen this stuff, right? And so, here's the slide that was corrected from last time. Yes, you had a question. How do you pick now different kernels? Like the class Gaussian. And is there like series of There is a lot of things. Okay, so the question is which kernel shape should I pick? So basically, as I said before, um, you probably want to get the size right. Shape doesn't matter that much. Um, so that's it. If you have ideas, about the smoothness of the underlying density. For instance, if you know that the underlying density is C infinity, then yeah, maybe using a Gaussian uh, a kernel isn't too bad. It also may depend on computational constraints. So if I want to do any of the tricks of what were suggested before, that I only restrict myself to a small region, then I need to pick some truncated function. So it's going to be a mix between what you want to prove how fast your code should run, and how much engineering you want to put into it. In practice, if you don't know any bit and you don't care that much about speed, just use a Gaussian kernel. Mm -hmm. For continuous state, or like, if you've been in infinite amounts, then the series still works. But uh, is there a connection mm -hmm. between like, the approximation of different kernels mm -hmm. with a amount of things? OK. So the question is, do different kernels have different approximation properties, yes. And there are a few papers in the Annals of Statistics and so on, where people look at different rates of approximation and so on in the limit and asymptotics under certain assumptions on the distributions. That's exactly why, if you're theoretically inclined, you would play a lot with different kernel shapes. In practice, if you have a very much more finite amount of data, Getting the scale right is going to, well, get you 90% of the way. So that's why I didn't go into this very much. But I would imagine that maybe Larry Wasserman and R.T. Singh's class, I don't know whether they're, they're discussing, uh, you know, kernel density estimates, a lot what's in the area, and so on. If they do, they might actually discuss some of those issues. So this would be a more advanced theoretically oriented machine learning class in which we could go through stuff. So I might teach such a class at some point, uh, but not here. Okay, so let's look at the, at least a tiny little theoretical argument and then we're basically done. Um, 
So what actually happens in the limit if we get more data? And so some of the first non-parametric results were proven in the context of k-nearest neighbor estimators. And there are very, very famous people who've proven good theorems for that. So let's first think about what happens in the one-nearest neighbor case. So if, you know, the data is perfectly separated, then you know we get the perfect solution because we get more and more points and then, you know, everything's going to be fine. But it will converge to twice the minimal error rate and I'll show you that on the next slide. Whereas for the k-nearest neighbor, if I let k slowly go to infinity as I get more data, I will actually get an estimate that will give me the base optimal error. And this is where I goofed up on the slide last time. This is now fixed. That one is, of course, the minimum between p and 1 minus p. OK, so let's go through this in detail. So for the one nearest neighbor, well, here's how you would basically design one of those groups. So, you know, a new point arrives, and as we get more data, you know, the probability of getting, you know, an observation within some small range of that point, of course, goes up. So I can make that, you know, distance as small as I want. And so I'm assuming that the probability distribution doesn't really change very much in that small epsilon neighbor. And of course, since, you know, I might take, you know, neighborhoods with probability mass d over n, I can immediately see that the probability of seeing at least one point in that neighborhood is like 1 minus e to the minus d. Actually, let me quickly derive that for you, because that's a useful derivation to know. So that trick you would see many, many times over. So remember we had basically that each of those bins had a probability mass of d over n. Now the probability of missing that one if I draw a single point is 1 minus d over n. Now if I draw n points from that, then the probability of, of missing is 1 minus d over n to the n. <coughs> Let me just write it in to the d, n over d, raised to 1 d. Now we know that this can be bounded by e to the minus 1. So therefore we get for the entire expression e to the minus d. And so, I can therefore make this as small as I want it. And in other words, I can therefore engineer it such that I can always be sure that I'll find at least one point in that neighborhood. And now, it just so happens that, well, I need to deal with, the, with two probabilities. You know, for this two, I need basically my test point x, and I need the x hat that I found as a neighbor. So this has, you know, la label 1 with probability p, and minus 1 with probability 1 minus p. This has, likewise, label 1 with probability p, 1 minus p. And things go wrong if these two guys don't match. So this goes wrong with p times 1 minus p, plus 1 minus p times p, and lo and behold, we get the plane, the 2p times 1 minus p. I've just left out, you know, all the epsilons and the fact that, you know, it's the density is quite constant in that region and so on, and this is exactly how you then write along the paper. Question? Um, when you say goes wrong, what do you mean by that? Well, so... <laughs> Okay, so goes wrong in this context is uh, that, you know, if I draw in points, I might not find anything in that, in that vicinity. But I can make that probability very small. And I can actually, you know, make it vanish by just letting, making D very large. So therefore, I can prove that my guarantee holds with high probability 
where the failure of that guarantee can be made as small as you possibly want it. And by driving that failure probability to zero, I can therefore give a good statement. And a lot of statistical analysis proofs work with that reasoning. They basically partition you know, the world into two cases. One is my assumptions are satisfied. And then there is one very small exception case with a very tiny probability why my assumptions don't fall. And so then you just need to make sure that the probability that things go wrong, as in that my assumptions don't hold, is sufficiently small. And then I proved a nice theorem for the case where my assumptions hold. And by plugging everything together, I get a probabilistic guarantee. That is a proof technique that people use over and over. Now, okay, here's neighbors. It's a little bit more tricky, right? Because we actually need to look at, you know, the, we need to look at the k nearest guys. So I need to pick a slightly larger neighborhood. I need to be careful about letting that grow as I get more data because I will also let k increase. And now I need to bound the probability that I will have the wrong majority in that neighborhood. So here's what happens. Huh? So let's say you know, zero is one, one half. And let's say I have an event of probability P, and I draw count from it so I get you know a binomial distribution. Yeah. And what you want to make sure is that any events here are really, really bounded. Now that's okay if that probability P is very far away from one half. If it gets close to one half, this gets hard. But the good thing is that in that vicinity, well, very close to one half, it doesn't really matter which label I use anyway, because it's just a toss up anyway. So that's why, in the end, this is the type of analysis that you would have to do for k-nearest neighbors to show that you get the optimal decision. And of course, the best things to do is to vote with a majority. So therefore, if the majority is to say, well, it's class minus 1, then with, I will say, OK, it's class minus 1. But then with probability p, I will actually observe something that has label 1. Right? And so then, well, the, the error is p. Whereas if p is greater than 1 half, then you know, we'll get the corresponding split the other way around. And so the error is 1 minus p. And so the best thing that I can do is I take the minimum between these two terms, p and 1 minus p. That's exactly what we have. Okay. So we're out of time. I'll just briefly tell you one thing which is actually really useful. So Andrew Moore who was a professor here who now runs the Google lab in Pittsburgh. He's one of the people who came up with very nice ideas of using KD trees for nearest neighbor type of lookups. So you basically partition your space such that if you know all those points are far away, you don't really need to search for a lane now. Somebody else, John Langford, who got his PhD from CMU, came up with cover trees, so it's Bagelsheimer and Langford. And they basically come up with a more clever hierarchical partitioning. And that also solves problems. And there, it's less dimension sensitive. OK. And so now, uh, I better sum up. So what we did today is we looked at parts and windows. If you want to know rates, here's the man who can ask about rates. Um, model selection, we touched a little bit upon it, what's in there and neighbors, and here's a lot of further reading. Um, you'll find that online with the type of Thank you. 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 Thank you.